UHF CB radio install, DIY style, and along the way you will learn plenty of stuff that no one else will teach you. Get ready to be enlightened and get equipped. G'day guys, Ronnie Dale, Torbs, Four Wheeling Australia. This video, a full DIY install of UHF radios and antennas. And handy electrical tips to save Ronnie from burning his car to the ground and you guys at home. Righto mate. We're also gonna do antenna placement. Where to put your antennas and what size. The size matter. And why we recommend where to put them. Where to mount your unit. And where to place your handset. Let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. What are we doing again? The hardware we're installing today, this is a TX4500. This is going in the roof console, so like an Ola style unit. This is new high tech stuff. This is the XRS 370C. This one has everything on the hand unit. It's a tuck away unit, so you can kind of hide it. Thieves don't see it. And it also does all kinds of cool stuff with your phone with Bluetooth. Two antennas which are interchangeable going on the roof and this other little rubber ducky antenna also going on the roof. So everything's going to the roof, we're staying away from the bull bar and we'll explain why. But there's more stuff here but we'll get to it as we go through the installation. Right now let's go over to Torbs and he'll explain what tools we need. I'm back from the future to show you what tools we did use because we didn't know at first exactly every tool we needed. My favourite, Yellow Tongue, helps you get all your cables through, the roof lining under the floor makes life so much easier. Drill, assortment of drill bits, solder, soldering iron of course for the solder, some tape, any colour you want, this is earth one, adjustable shifter, we use the 17mm open end spanner, you probably use different ones depending on what aerials and radio you use, an assortment of screwdrivers, torch of course because it gets dark in under the dash, corry hose, everybody's favourite, the cable tie, silicon spray to be able to feed your cables through the grommets nice and easy, driver just makes life easier, yes we're lazy, a knife trimming back, Ronnie's favourite, his nail clippers while he sat back and watched me do the whole job, <laughs> and silicon to fill your grommets, and a good pair of trusty pliers, I always use my own, they're attached to me. And if you've got a handheld, good way to uh, check if your radio is working if you're on your own. Not that many tools you need. Hope you enjoy the video. Power options for connecting up your radio. Number one, your Siggy lighter in the cab. Option two, your main cranking battery. But if you've got an auxiliary battery, I'd recommend connecting it to there so you don't flatten your crank battery. And with the 70 series, we've got a power outlet on the opposite side, which has accessory and permanent power, which makes it nice and easy. And I believe on most other four wheel drives, they have them too. So that was three really good options for starting out wiring a vehicle. In our case, there is pre-existing wiring and it's coming off the accessories switch. So for me to use my radios, the vehicle has to have the accessories switched on or the vehicle switched on. Antennas, probably the most frequently asked question and the most important question I think when it comes to UHF radios and signal. 2.1 dBi versus 6.6. .6. Well, 6.6 .6 casts a narrower beam, but it's still a decent beam. A 2.1 casts more of a ball beam. Won't travel as far, but will travel to more areas around you when you're in hilly areas. You see, the narrower the beam, the less effective it is in a hilly area. Think about it. If your vehicle is going up and down, up and down, when you're driving at fast speeds, sometimes the wind will push your antenna back, especially if a headwind. And if you're casting a narrow signal, it's going to be shooting up and shooting down. So the, the lower the DBI on your antennas, like these ones on the top here, 2.1, the more of a ball they will cast. So when it comes to antenna choice, you should choose something between 2.1 and up to 6.6. .6. Anything beyond 6.6 .6 is a waste of time unless you only drive on flat roads and that's it. When you get up to about an eight, a nine or a 12, your beam is super narrow, but can shoot further, but it's not worth the benefit of that further casting. The first thing you need to do is lay out the cable and the antennas and the head units where you think you're gonna put them and make sure you have enough length on cable. 
Now, let me just say it right here in case we don't say it later. Never, ever, 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 ever cut your cable because these cables have to be at a certain length. If the cables are not long enough, then you'll need to go to a professional and get it extended or get a longer version or you'll need to work with what you have. We already know where we're going to mount these antennas and I'll show you that in a second, but let's talk about head units. If mounting two radios to your vehicle, there's one critical thing you need to keep in mind, and that is to not mount both radios next to each other. So if you have them both up high or both down low or both in the same area, you're not going to be able to tell which radio is talking to you. So the rule of thumb here is one high and one low, or one front and one back. And then you can clearly distinguish which radio is talking to you. If you guys would like to run two radios as well, you don't have to have two mounted radios. You can go one mounted and one handheld. It'll do the same job. You just won't get the same distance on a handheld as you will with a mounted radio because your antenna is up higher. Head units, where to mount them? Well, this is good for you guys because we have a hideaway unit and we have a unit which you need to look at and play with. So let's talk about where you can mount this unit first. With the 4500 head unit, there's a couple of options for installing. You get the DIN kit, so you can put it in your dash. Some people put it down the footwell. But in our case today, in Ronnie's car, we're gonna to go to the head console, because that's where his old radio was. So we're gonna fit this one back up in here. Uh, 8, 9 and a 10, right in the eyeball. That's a lot of dust here, from all around the country. It's almost a shame to wipe this off. Cop the screw to the eyeball, lucky I didn't wear my glasses, I eh? would have scratched my glasses. Nah, probably should have worn glasses, but you never expect that. Um, I'm happy to report that this fits like an absolute glove. So make sure we don't put it in upside down. Have a go at that. Perfect. Don't have to muck around with the insert or anything. That's awesome. So we'll just put a few packers on the inside of it. We're gonna pack this up real good. There's no room for a bracket. So to make sure this doesn't rattle loose while we're on corrugations and whatnot, um, I'm going to pack it underneath. So wedges it up and I'm also gonna put a packer here. So I've just got to find something to wedge in there. Now to the hideaway unit. Now this is a great option for a lot of people who want to keep their dash clean as well, or you want to hide this away so, you know, thieves can't see it. So in this case, you would normally mount this somewhere around the dash because it's nice and close to where all your wiring and power needs are. But in my case, I've got other stuff mounted where I would put this so it's going to go on the back of the center console or behind the seat. We're still to determine that. But those are the two other hot spots to put it. The cool thing about this one is you can put a Cat6 cable in it or you can connect directly to this unit. But we are going to connect this wire to it, hide the unit, hide the cable, and then this will pop out either on the center console or on the dashboard. We pulled out one of these blanks and we decided to put the switch right here or the outlet, I should say, where you can then plug your radio mic into. And there you go. So that is a cool way to hide your unit. And then when you stop using your unit, or you're not traveling out back or whatever, pull this out, no one, can, no one even knows you have a radio in the car. So that's another good reason to have a hideaway unit. I found a spot to mount this unit, and it's right in the middle, so it kind of helps Torbs out with his antenna wires coming through and it's going to help me with where I'm going to mount the actual handset. So down here, I'll put the bracket on an angle. Now you won't see it because, you know, brackets on an angle will actually be quite ugly. So I'm going to spin it this way. The reason why I put the bracket on the angle is because of the seat belt right here. So I wanted to avoid this being too close to the seat belt, otherwise the seat belt, you know, corrugations, whatever, got a passenger, it's going to come up and rub on a cable. We don't want that. Uh, also, this angle is going to help me get this Cat6 cable down and out of the way. But you won't see this once the seat's in. So, that's where I decided to mount it. Quite easy, plastic screws, straight into the plastic trim.
So in all seriousness, just a quick tip when working with the aerials, make sure you have your radiation hat on. Now it's time to talk about antenna placement. So the most common place that people mount their antennas is the bulba. Now there's nothing wrong with mounting it on the bulba, it's, it's an easy place to mount it. But from all the years of mucking around with my radios, I've found that the little rubber ducky, 2.1 dB on the roof, gets a better throw than Torbs' 6.6s on the front of his vehicle. Let me explain what I've done. The project at hand. Torbs has got the first antenna sussed. We've got that laid out, drilled in, fixed in. Back there you can notice the old 2.1 antenna I've had. Now I've had that for a long time and I'm starting to get a bit of interference through the, the radio which I just pulled out. I believe it's due to that antenna. So it has had a few knocks, but it's lasted five years. So I'm pretty impressed with this antenna. We're going to replace it with the new one. We are going to put it right here as well. And then that keeps the antennas as far away as possible on this roof rack on a diagonal. So I think we've got nearly two meters there on a diagonal. What you want to be is about at least 1.5 meters away. And you don't want the same height antenna because this will be casting from this whole bit here out in a 360 degree radius, that'll be casting up higher because it's elevated. So that way I shouldn't get interference. I reckon that's gonna work really well. So I'm looking forward to testing it out, but both antennas up here, I'm going to get like supreme coverage. The reason why I put them on the roof is so that I can cast 360 degrees. Now with your antenna on the bull bar, you can also cast 360 degrees, but you have glass and layers and layers of metal and seats and all that. And if you've got a canopy on the back, everything behind your windscreen is blocking your signal shooting backwards. So picture it like that. And then around that way, you're casting that way, you're not casting backwards. When you mount your antenna to the bull bar, you are at risk of running next to or parallel to high current cables with your signal cable. So if your signal cable is too close to a high current cable, you will get interference when you are casting or when you're broadcasting your signal out to other people. So when you're talking on your handset, people can hear your alternator, sometimes your turbo, all kinds of bad feed coming through your signal because you are running it too close to some high current cabling. If you are going to do this, run it on the opposite side of where all your batteries are and you'll have a far better chance of having a clean signal. You wanna keep it as far to the side of your bull bar as possible so the signal can go down the side of your car. It might sound silly, but they throw out radioactive waves. And yeah, if you can get the line of sight past your car, it gives a bit better. Way. As Ronnie was saying, having the aerials on the roof gets much a bigger coverage. Now I'm looking forward to getting out there, to seeing the difference between the 2.1 and the 6.6. .6. See if size does make a difference. Hey, put your hat on. <laughs> Safety first. When pulling cable through little holes like this, just make sure that you guide it through because the edges will be sharp. And the last thing you want to do is nick your cable because then you need a whole new setup. So here is a new antenna. If this snaps, I have to replace the whole cable. That is the biggest con with this type of antenna. However, the pro is there's no extra connections. So this will have a better feed than this one would because every single connection that you add into the system is going to rob a little bit of your signal strength. Now it might not be much, but it's still some. So therefore, this will be a better option for signal strength. However, if you should snap the cable or snap the antenna, you're gonna to have to replace the whole thing. Perfect. We've got our tubing over our coax to protect it. Especially with the Australian sun, it'll eat it up in no time, so it saves us having to replace it. Corrugated tubing. This is our preferred, the fully sealed one, and this is your most common split tubing. Pros and cons. Well, the only con with this one is it's super expensive compared to the split corry. But dirt, dust, water, anything cannot get into this, and it is super strong. It won't just squash. The split tubing is easy to source, easy to get anywhere, but 
can squish up quite easily. Dirt, dust, water, anything can get in here. Preferably doing wiring to the outside of your vehicle, you want to use this stuff here, if you can afford it. This stuff here is fine for indoors, like inside the cab. That'll run under the roof rack now, down the back of the cab, through the grommet, and under the carpet to the radio. So, get it in now. So we just run both coaxes down the back of the uh, cab and poke them through the grommet. Uh, it's nice and easy to get to this grommet. It's right here. Uh, a handy little tip is once you've finished, you want to fill that hole with silicon to stop any water running down the cable and coming in. But don't do it until you're completely finished because no doubt you're going to pull on the cable, silicon's going to go everywhere and make a mess. So do that dead last. Handy tip, if your corrugated tubing is a bit tight, with the cables, silicon spray is always a good go. However, this one's nice and easy now. Yep, it's all over. We're gonna solder some wires down here. We've pulled the CAT6 cable through to the XRS unit, and we pull the power back the other way. The yellow tongue, he calls it. So in the sparky world, this is bloody handy. Can, you, can uh, normal people buy this? Yep. It's actually but, uh, comes out of um, mezzanine floors. That's what joins them together. Oh, no way. Yeah. Okay. What I used to use was tie wire. I used to double it over so you had a blunt end on it. Otherwise, you, you end up stabbing things and then feed up through. But this is much easier. That's right. And you can manipulate this in any direction and then just bend it back to where it was before. I reckon this just made a 10 minute job turn it into a 2 minute job. I reckon. This has saved us heaps of time, eh? Oh yeah. We're pulling back the carpet so you can see. These are the two wires we ran underneath the carpet. We didn't even have to pull the carpet out too much. We just ran that yellow tongue under here and out they came. Easy peasy. Path of least resistance. All right, when we ran the wires through, came out of that grommet and followed this channel all the way to the front. but for the antenna that's going under this carpet over to here where the unit is mounted. So just straight under the carpet. The bonus is if you have car mats in the rear, even if there is a bulge underneath the carpet, you can't see it, it's hidden. But should you have enough cable, follow the lines around to the edges because then there's less chance of having big bulges, especially if you're running a lot of cable through. And that's the beauty about carpet and ceiling. It doesn't matter where the wire goes, you're not gonna see it. <laughs> We're nearly there. The final cable to go to the roof is coming up now. That's the uh, communication cable, the coax cable. It's gonna come up through here. We're gonna pull all this trim off and get it through the ceiling. It's a pretty easy job. But uh, now back to Torps. All right, big bonus for us is because we're replacing radios and coax cable, we can just join the cable and use it as a draw wire. Ready? Sweet as. Here we go. Yeah, that came through pretty easy. And look, another good tip there, if it's a bit tight where you're pulling it through, use a bit of silicon. Try not to pull too tight, because this is a important cable. This is your communication, you don't want to damage it. We're up to the uh, critical part. This is the part where Ronnie is banned. Hey. We're going to join the new power plug that fits into the radio to the existing power. So we've got it nice and easy, it's already run. Do you want a beer? Oh yeah. Perfect time. Electrical work while drinking. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that aside. <laughs> Tip is when you're joining cables, always cut the cores offset. That way you don't have any issues of them shorting out together. And there you go. There's the two joins offset. They won't touch. All ready for soldering now. 
Well, this isn't my car, so if we drop any salt or burn any holes in the carpet or the seats. Oh, hey, yeah. I'm right here. <laughs> oh, so we put a tray just in case. Yeah. This is a fancy little soldering iron. It's actually a USB one. Oh, look at that. It's getting hot already. That is quick. Let it soak all the way through. There we go. We're now connecting the coax cable. That's in. Make sure that's really tight because corrugations can rattle these loose and when they're loose, they're, oh my god, it's, it annoys the crap out of you because it's up here and you have to pull everything apart just to tighten it up. So I made sure that's absolutely tight. Power cable next. A lot of good radios come with double-sided tape and screws for fixing your mic holder. I'd recommend using your double-sided tape. Uh, the double-sided tape you get nowadays, they are so strong. Stick it to your dash, change your mind later. There's no holes in your dash from screws, so you can interchange it anywhere. Change around, up high, down low. That's my tip. This is the old handset, and you've got this, the old hook up here. Sometimes you can fumble around for it. Now I've grown accustomed to it, so it's not too bad, but for people who are not used to it, you, know, you want to keep your eyes on the road, you don't want to be mucking around with this. My passengers often do that actually. So that's going to be replaced with, wait for it, the magnet. I'm not even looking. That's wicked. Love the magnet. Pull the old one out. A little bit of dusty on there. Just been eavesdropping on some truckies on 40. Oh, yeah, that's like um, blokes on blokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, so we know that one works. Um, I'm too scared to ask for a radio check on this one. Can I get a radio check, Cobb? Nah, sorry, mate, it's not working. <laughs> Cheeky bastard. Righto, Torbs, how are we going? Channel 52, do you have a copy? Yeah, buddy, coming through loud and clear. Sweet. Two radios that work. Super. Ah, so I'm getting sound there and there. I can distinguish which radio is which, which is cool. All right. Cool. That's awesome. Two antennas are now on the roof. Two head units are installed. It's all done, dusted. We have done a radio check. Yep. And yeah, we picked up all the dirty truck drivers in the area. <laughs> we did. We started this at about 11 a.m. because we were setting up cameras and we moving all stuff out of here so we had space to do it. And we finished at about five. We just had some pizza and a garlic bread is really smashing my taste buds right now. <laughs> How long should people expect to do this? We did two radios. We did do two replacements. We did two and we replacements. Filmed, so it took ages, it was two of us. Be honest, I reckon if you just allowed a day on a weekend, and just did it at a nice steady pace. It's not something you want to rush. No, definitely not. I mean, if you want to get down to hours, I reckon five hours for a beginner. Five yep. hours for a beginner, use this video as a guideline and invite yep. a mate over, shout them some beers and you'll probably still be done in five hours, but it'll be more relaxing, right? That's right. So any questions, now's the time to put them down below because we are going to do a talking 4 by 4 just on this topic. Anything about you, Hatch Chef Radios, usage, install, whatever. And any of the technical stuff, we're going to speak to the experts about that. Yeah, definitely. And get them pre-answered for you guys, so we know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. Because we got a pretty good idea, but it's a whole new world. Oh yeah. Yeah, the experts know exactly how these things work. Tests to come, talking 4x4 to come with the UHF topic. And thanks for watching, and I hope you guys learned how to DIY install and got flooded with good information along the way. Yeah. Cool. Beauty. Take it easy. See you on the next one.